So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, like Inmundo said, I work at the World Bank. Um, I've been working there for more than six years now, and I was initially um, hired to help mainstream or at least um, use the MDU methods in the work that the World Bank does. So the World Bank, um, for those of you who are not very familiar with the institution, works with governments in low and middle income countries. Um, and, and we support governments through loans, but also through technical assistance. And we work with them on developing policy and um, a lot of infrastructure investments. So the MDU methods make a lot of sense in this context um, because so good development policy is challenging for many reasons. One of them being the very rapid changes that you see in some low and middle income countries uh, because of shifts in demographics, migrations, but also the built environment changes very rapidly. And so um, it's important in that context to make sure we're not creating huge vulnerabilities in the future. Uh, of course, there's also a lot of competing priorities between stakeholders. Uh, one example is conservation and protection of biodiversity versus rapid expansion spatially of economic activities. And then there's a lot of deep uncertainties involved in the decisions. The one for which I came to the World Bank was climate change, of course, um, because this is what my expertise was on. But there are also, there's a lot of other deep uncertainties that need to be considered. There are um, social economic uncertainties. And right now we've seen that uh, events like pandemics also have a huge impact on development policy. Julie, quick note. Um, we, we don't see your slides yet. Uh, are you uh, showing them? Yeah. Oh, uh, we, we see your desktop screen. Um, oh, you don't? We, we don't. They are on the screen. Let me see. Uh, we, we, I see your uh, computer desktop, but um, we don't see yet your um, your slides. Do they have two screens? Well, let me try the second. Screen. Oh, the, now now I see it. Now, now we see it. Now that you uh, now we see your slides. Ah, okay. Then I was sharing the wrong screen. Okay, so um, I think yeah. Full screen then. So I was Perfect. talking about this. Um, I guess this is just an illustration of what I was saying. Okay, so we want to use the MDU at the World Bank uh, for many reasons. So for when we work with governments to help uh, better planning, to help build consensus on some difficult decisions uh, when there's great luck. Um, but we also apply it to some of the research that we do. And I'm, I'm going to start with this in my presentation. We do some research for global reports um, that we publish regularly. And in, in 2015, we did a study on the impacts of climate change on poverty. And I used the MDU in the modeling approach um, that I did for this report. So I'm going to present this. And then, of course, we also want to use the MDU methods for um, the projects that we finance uh, and the policies that we finance. And so uh, on this, I'm going to present an example of how we use DMDU for prioritizing projects and for the economic analysis of infrastructure projects. The um, report that I was mentioning is called Shock Waves, um, and it's the um, what, it was the World Bank contribution to the Paris um, negotiations in 2015, and it was the first time that we were bringing together all the literature on the impacts of climate change on poverty. Um, at the time, most of the literature that existed was looking at the impacts of climate change on GDP and then sometimes using a link between GDP and poverty to uh, translate those impacts. But if you look at how GDP is distributed in the world and that those percentages are from 2016, so it might have changed a little bit, but you see that um, looking at the impact on GDP really hides what's happening uh, to poor countries and poor people. So we wanted to take a completely different approach. And instead, um, we looked at climate change 
from a household perspective and from a poverty perspective. So we did that through two innovations. One is using a micro simulation model to model the impact of climate change directly on households uh, instead of going through GDP. And the second innovation is to systematically explore the uncertainty pertaining to future demographic and socioeconomic changes. Um, because if we want to look at climate change impacts on poverty, we need to project people into the future. We need to project poverty into the future. And depending on the assumptions that we make, climate change impacts can be very different. Um, what you see on those two pictures, for example, if, uh, if a lot of people are still living in informal neighborhoods with very poor access to basic infrastructure services, high vulnerability to disasters, the impacts of climate change will be much worse than if people are living um, in new neighborhoods protected against disasters. So there are lots of variables that we had to take into account when we projected poverty in 2030. Um, these variables include structural change. For example, a lot of countries are shifting um, from uh, an economy based on agriculture to more services and manufacturing. There's productivity growth. There are big demographic changes. And of course, um, all of this impact on poverty also depends on the existence of social safety nets um, and redistribution policy. So all of this and how all of these parameters will change by 2030, we want to be able to model. So we took this, the micro simulation model. We identified uh, 12 parameters that we thought were deeply uncertain for projecting people in 2030. And for each country, we identified reasonable boundaries for these parameters. And uh, we generated hundreds of scenarios by randomly uh, combining assumptions on these parameters. So using the model, then we ended up with those hundreds of scenarios that you can see here for Sierra Leone as an example, where on the X axis is the outcome of the model in terms of economic growth. So here it's consumption growth um, between the base year in 2030 and the Y axis is the average income of the bottom 20%, which is a proxy for poverty. Um, and each of those circle in this graph is one scenario. So you can see there's some correlation between economic growth and poverty reduction, but that correlation is not uh, perfect. And you can find some scenarios that have high economic growth, but also very high poverty. Now, what's interesting and very useful with the MDU approaches is, is identifying what are the conditions that will make you end up in a, in a world with a lot of poverty or um, low poverty, high economic growth. And in the case of Sierra Leone, one of the main drivers was the demographic scenario. And you can see here that in all the scenarios that, high, that have high population growth and lower education levels, um, the poverty level are always the highest. So we did that systematically for all countries using sophisticated algorithms um, and we identified the main drivers of poverty reduction by 2030. And what you see on this map is that the main drivers of poverty reduction depends on the context and on the country. Uh, the countries in purple here are very low income countries usually, um, and poverty reduction by 2030 is driven a lot by assumptions on population. But then if you take the countries in red, like China, Mexico, Brazil, there are more middle income countries. And there, what matters are redistribution policies and social safety net. It means that those countries are rich enough to redistribute their way out of extreme poverty. Um, yeah, so maybe something I need to specify is that when I talk about poverty, I'm talking about extreme poverty, uh, who are the number of people living below $1.90 per day. Um, now you, you can also see that some countries like Ethiopia or Vietnam um, really depend on the agriculture sector and poverty reduction in 2030 depends on 
what's happening um, to agricultural productivity. So based on these main drivers that we had identified, and so here I'm showing the one main driver, but usually it's also a combination of parameters that will um, lead you to a scenario with low poverty or high poverty in 2030. So we identified those combinations of parameters and we use them to build two global scenarios. One very optimistic scenario that we call prosperity. Um, that's the scenario in which there's high economic growth, um, eradication of extreme poverty in 2030, which is one of the objectives of the international community and the World Bank, reduction in inequality and increased access to basic services. And then we built another scenario that we call the poverty scenario, which still has some economic growth and some poverty reduction, but much slower than the prosperity scenario, which means that by 2030, we don't reach um, this international goal of eradication of extreme poverty. So we take these two scenarios and um, we add climate change impacts in each of them. And to model climate change impacts, we model them through four channels. One is agriculture prices and revenues for farmers. One is the increased impacts of natural disasters. One is increased costs of uh, health services because of increased stunting, malaria and diarrhea, and then the temperature impacts on labor productivity. So those, we model uh, climate change impacts by 2030, which means that they're still pretty low compared to what they could be in the future, but we start to see some impacts in 2030. Um, and what we find actually from modeling these impacts in all the baseline scenarios is that the most important channels are through agricultural prices and through health costs, which are things that are gonna be worse and worse over time. So now if I show you the results at the global level in terms of the poverty impacts, we find that in the prosperity scenario, which is the scenario in which we managed to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030, the impacts of climate change are relatively small. Um, it's 60 million people, 16 million people pushed back into extreme poverty in 2030 because of climate change impacts. And they're mostly concentrated in a few very poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Which means that good development policy that can pull people out of poverty in the next 10 years would prevent most of the impacts of climate change on poverty. But then if we look at the poverty scenario, which is the most the more pessimistic scenario, we find that then uh, 122 million people could be pushed back into poverty because of climate change impacts, um, which means that if we're not good enough between now and 2030, things will get even worse after 2030. Um, here, again, a lot of the impacts are concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in South Asia. Another result that we get from exploring all these scenarios is that in all scenarios and all countries, the poorest people are gonna be more affected by climate change impacts than the rest of the population. What you see on this graph here on the x-axis is the average income loss in the population because of climate change. The y-axis is the income loss of the bottom 40% in the population. And on average, they're losing 70% more than the average population. And that's because poor people are more exposed and vulnerable to natural disasters. They also spend a higher share uh, of their budget on food. So when food prices increase, they will be hit harder. And then they're more likely to work outside and have productivity loss because of temperature increase. So this, um, the main conclusions from that study that we published in 2015 was that good development by 2030 is key to reduce the future impacts of climate change, at least in the short term. Um, and that if you focus on getting people access to infrastructure services, access to healthcare, getting them out of informal um, jobs and neighborhoods, then um, climate change wouldn't be too bad. Of course, impacts are likely to be higher after 2030, so there's also a need for specific adaptation policies. 
But now we're working on updating this analysis um, this year using more recent household surveys. So now the base year would be 2016, a uh, better representation of natural disasters impacts, which was a bit crude um, last time, and adding the uncertainty related to the COVID-19 crisis impacts on poverty, because right now all our poverty economists are projecting a huge impact of the current pandemic on poverty through um, the economic losses. So the interaction between what's happening right now, the stimulus policies that will be needed and future climate change impacts that are likely to happen by 2030 is a new interesting research question. So we'll use more or less the same approach, but updated results. So we'll keep you updated on this. Let me now move to how we use DMDU in our operations. Um, and I want to use the example of a rural road project in Mozambique, because here again, um, the project is really focused on the poorest population and getting them access to markets to develop the agriculture sector. So the objective of that project um, is to improve rural accessibility in the poorest provinces in Mozambique and agriculture production. We were working on this with the National Road Agency and also some of the local transport agencies. The problem that people have um, in those two provinces is recurrent floods. I don't know if you've heard about the floods and hurricanes in Mozambique, but uh, every year or every two, three years, they have big events, but they also have regular floods that destroy um, the bridges and completely isolate some communities from the transport network. And so from markets and economic potential. So during the preparation of this project, we worked with the road agency on an analytical tool that would help us prioritize where to invest and then what kind of investments would make the most sense. So the first part was identifying which districts within these two provinces um, would be best for investing, in which district we would have the highest impacts. And then the second step would be to run some robust decision-making analysis to stress these different investments and see which one's the most robust. Um, the prioritization was based on a lot of criteria. One was investing where it's critical. And when I say critical, it means critical for the functioning of the road network. So where there's not enough redundancy in the network, we want to add more roads. We also want to prioritize areas that have a high agriculture or fishery potential that also have high current agriculture production. The two might be different um, and areas where the poverty rate is high. But then we also want to combine this information with risk information and flood risk information in particular to make sure we invest in areas where um, there is a need to invest in protection against floods. So we, um, we built a road network model that we used to look at, for example, the lack of redundancy and the additional cost that people, that road users would have to pay um, if some of these roads were disrupted. So here in red, you see the roads for which there's almost no redundancy. So if they're flooded, people have to uh, pay a much higher cost to go around and reach their destinations. We also use data on current and potential agriculture production and on poverty rates at the local level to see which roads were the most critical. And then for risk, we overlaid the road network with um, flood maps for current, I mean, and past rainfall events, but also taking into account future climate change impacts on the, on the intensity and frequency of those floods the risk is calculated as the expected damage to the infrastructure. So we combined criticality and risk and came up with a prioritization of all those different districts, uh, which are the ones in, in red on this map. 
Now that we had prioritized the district, we wanted to know, okay, which are the most robust investments that we can do in those chosen districts? And here we use the economic analysis of the project to help us select the best investments. I'm insisting on this point because the way these things usually work is that um, we agree with the local agency or with the governments on which investments are best. And then we do an economic analysis at the end just to check that the benefits are actually going to be higher than the costs. But usually the economic analysis is not used to make the decision. Here, we want to use the analysis to make the decision. And we also want to take into account all the uncertainties that will impact the results to make sure that we're going to select investments that are robust in the sense that they will uh, generate those economic benefits that are promised, no matter what happens in the future. So we started um, with some workshops with the local engineers um, who know the road network very well to understand what they think should be um, the investments in those different districts. And they selected combinations of investments within the budget that we had. And so they gave us for each district between five and 10 different combinations of investments that they would like to see ideally to improve the road network. Now, for each of these combinations of investments, we did this cost benefit analysis under uncertainty. And here, um, we included in the analysis the usual benefits of road investments like maintenance savings and reduction of road user costs, but we also included the resilience benefits in there. And what I call resilience benefits would be um, reduction of flood damage to infrastructure thanks to the investment and the reduction of flood disruption costs for the users. And then for uncertainties is basically all the parameters that enter the analysis um, that we varied using a pretty wide range, just because those parameters in areas where economic growth is very volatile are really hard to predict. So here what you see is are the different benefits of five different combinations of investments. And at the bottom, you have the usual benefits from road investments. And at the top, you have the benefits in terms of reduced user losses from floods and reduced damages. And if you look at the order of magnitude, you'll see that the resilience benefits are much higher than the usual benefits from road investments. You also see that investment number three is the only one that actually significantly reduce damages because it's mostly upgrading culverts and cleaning bridges, which are uh, drainage infrastructure. So in the end, if we bring costs and benefits together, we find that this um, investment number three is the most robust one because it's, it's the best investment in the majority of the scenarios. And it also has a benefit cost ratio higher than one in 95% of the scenarios. It's also um, the investment with the lowest regret. Now we still did a stress test just to see under which conditions the benefits would be lower than the costs, just to make sure. And we found that those were scenarios in which the discount rate is high and the bridge construction cost is also much higher than our current estimates, which happens usually. But then the discount rate for these kinds of investments in rural areas where the objective is mostly poverty reduction more than economic growth, we don't use discount rates, rates as high as 11%. So we were pretty safe that we were investing in a project that would generate the benefits we were looking for. Another important part of this project was that if we want to have some sort of transformative impact through those projects, we need the road agency to be able to replicate these analysis for other investments, for other road investments. So we helped build this user tool um, that would allow the National Road Agency to replicate this kind of analysis for all the investments that they have to make. And actually this tool, they're using it right now and we are um, upgrading it in Haiti where the road agency there also wanted to use the same approach. <clears throat> 
So if I conclude on this um, analysis, I think the things we learned from it is that first taking into account the resilience benefits, which are avoided losses from floods, can really increase benefits and multiply them by four to six in this case. Uh, the systematic consideration of uncertainties allows identifying robust investments, but also isolating the parameters that matter. In our case, we saw that the benefits would be lower than the costs, mostly because of the assumption we make on the discount rate, which is a choice from us rather than a deep uncertainty related to climate change. So we were confident that we were making the right choice. And then maybe I didn't mention it enough, but stakeholder engagement was key through the whole process. So we worked with the road agency and with local farmers and stakeholders um, from the beginning to the end of this, the whole process for the prioritization and the robust decision making took a bit more than a year. And we had maybe two or three or four workshops during that process. I think the main challenge here is making sure that the lessons learned from the process will stay uh, with the road agency and not just with the World Bank, because um, that's uh, quite a big investment on our side. We don't have a lot of people who know how to do uh, all of these and this approach. And so it, it's great if then um, the road agency can actually replicate it themselves without us being there. Now, I'm, I'm almost done with my presentation. I think the final remarks I want to make about, about the whole views of the MDU is that these tools are becoming more important than ever, especially now in the context of the COVID crisis where there's so much uncertainty about um, what the economic impacts are going to be and all governments want to rush into stimulus investments, which usually are infrastructure investments uh, to create jobs um, and to try to restart the economy. It's really important to consider future uncertainties, especially related to long-term challenges like climate change um, and make sure that we're not creating new vulnerabilities with the response to the current crisis. Now, in terms of uh, what we need from the broader DMDU community and research community and consulting um, groups, I think we need in general widespread, more widespread use of those approaches, even when there's pressure to prepare projects very quickly. Um, we probably need more models that take into account the economic and social aspects of infrastructure projects, because usually what we find are very engineering models. And we want to be able to use the MDU also for economic analysis. Um, but finally, I also think we need more qualitative approaches in this idea that we need to go fast. And sometimes, especially right now, um, the World Bank is trying to lend um, and, and give a lot of money to governments for them to respond to the crisis. And it would be good to have quick approaches that allow governments and utilities to think a little bit about future uncertainty.